So what is, how do we compute the analyzed return? Well, actually a little bit tricky uh, in, in this particular example because it's an intraday strategy. Uh, notice that um, uh, the data actually span only the, uh, the trading hours 8.30 to 15.15 central time. That's when the um, ES future was traded um, well, I, actually, I, it's not when the ES future is traded, but that's when uh, the the PIT traded SP contract was on, and that's when I captured this data, and that's where the historical data was uh, was actually captured. So when you uh, uh, analyze this uh, this return, uh, you have to uh, be very careful because, first of all, when you compute them, you, you know, first of, the first step, of course, is to use the smart mean tool, which is, again, a, uh, an average function that ignore any NAN. But actually, here, we don't have NAN. So by all means, just use the function mean, OK? You can use the built-in function mean to compute the average per bar return. But to analyze it, you have to figure out how many bars there are in a year. And remember, those bars exist only during this trading hour. So uh, we, we assume that we have no bars during the, uh, off, um, uh, the overnight period. So you should not multiply the number of bars in a whole 24-hour cycle. You should only uh, multiply that mean return by the number of bars in that 8.30 to 3.15 period, central time, and then multiply by the number of trading days a year. So you should get an average return of 11.7%. Okay. Uh, similarly, you want to compute the analyzed volatility, you can use the STD function. Uh, again, you don't need the smart STD because I'm hoping that you have already cleaned up the NAN, so STD will work just as fine. And then, but to, uh, to analyze the volatility, uh, again, you have to multiply this per bar standard deviation by the square root of n, where n is the number of bars in a year. And then, again, you have to make sure that you are multiplying the 252 trading days times the number of bars in the trading day uh, from 8.30 to 15.15. And you should get an annualized volatility of 8.3% for this strategy. Uh, I encourage you to give it a try to see if you get these numbers. Okay, I'm, I will not um, waste your time by uh, demonstrating going through this, but just make sure that if you get something close to this uh, at your own free time. And by the way, this lecture, you know, this webinar is recorded. So if you miss something, uh, feel free to go into your account and look up the recording for today. So you, you, you will be able to rerun the whole thing at your leisure, uh, at least for the next, uh, from now to and at least for a month uh, forward, you can do that. Um, and you can, you know, try MATLAB to see if you get these numbers uh, at, uh, you know, sort of a homework, you, you might call it. Um, so these are the answers, but you don't have to read that. Uh, and then finally, uh, okay, not finally, but the next step is to compute the Sharpe ratio. The Sharpe ratio, if you have computed the annualized return and annualized volatility, the Sharpe ratio is easy. It's just the ratio of the two. Now, what is the reason why we like sharp ratio. There are actually quite a few reasons why we like sharp ratio. Uh, everybody knows sharp ratio as a risk adjusted return. So obviously, uh, just uh, you know, if you have a good return, but you take a lot of risk to accomplish that return, it's not as good as if you have the same return but take on very little risk. So it's in some sense a risk adjusted return. Although I must say that the risk that we are measuring in the sharp ratio is a normal risk. It is not a tail risk. And people are nowadays are very aware of the difference between the normal volatility and this kind of abnormal volatility, which we call tail risk, the black swan risk. The sharp ratio doesn't measure the, sharp, uh, the uh, tail risk very well. So we are only talking about measuring the um, normal uh, risk of a strategy, day-to-day -day fluctuation, not when uh, the, uh, in, you know, 2008 kind of risk, okay? Um, 
another property of sharp ratio is that the higher the sharp ratio, uh, the higher the leverage you can run the strategy. Theoretically speaking, again, this is discounting the effect of tail risk. If there's if the return distribution is truly normal, which we know is it isn't, but let's pretend for a moment that the return distribution of this strategy is really normal, that there's no tail risk. Maybe you have gotten rid of the tail risk by using options, right? Maybe you have gotten rid of the tail risk by using stop loss. I don't know how you get rid of that, but let's assume that we don't have tail risk, you only have this normal variance, normal standard deviation. Then uh, the higher the sharp ratio, the higher the leverage you can run it using Kelly's formula. That's something I don't won't discuss in this course, but I have discussed in my first book, which is that um, the optimal leverage according to the Kelly formula is proportional uh, to um, the sharp ratio. So the higher the sharp ratio, the higher the uh, optimal leverage you can use, and the higher the compound return you can achieve with this strategy. So that's in second important property of the sharp ratio. Um, and then, actually, I, I didn't write it down here, but the third important property of sharp ratio is that it is a measure of the statistical significance of your back test. If you have a high sharp ratio, it indicates that your back test has significance. It's not a fluke. If you have slow sharp ratio, uh, it indicates that your back test may, you know, even if you have a good return, it might just due to luck. So there are three important reasons why we like sharp ratio. And uh, and to be precise, sharp ratio is defined as the average access return divided, you know, by the average volatility of access return. So it's not exactly just the average return. Uh, it should be the average access return. And what does access return mean? The access return means that it is the return minus the funding cost. Uh, usually the funding cost is, is the risk-free rate. But in the case of the ES future, if you are trading future, actually there's no funding cost. So we actually don't need to subtract the risk free rate. This is a point I'm going to take up uh, uh, on Thursday. So we will return on Thursday uh, for the second day of our lecture, uh, for our webinar. And I will um, drill down on this point of, of the notion of funding cost and excess return and so forth as it is uh, relates to the computation of the sharp ratio. But for now, um, you know, let's, uh, that's it for today. And, um, you know, again, thanks for coming and have a good evening. And I will see you again um, on Thursday. And don't forget, the recording will be available right away. All right, good night. Uh, and, uh, but, but by the way, before I go, you know, if you have any questions, please feel free to fire at me, um, you know. Otherwise, uh, I will see you on Thursday. All right. Thank you. Good night.